Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program, GoFundMe and Not Replace Wills, Trusts, and Estate Planning, What You Need to Know to Protect Your Family and Assets. The Chicago Bar Association is one of the oldest and largest municipal bar associations in the nation with over 18,000 lawyers and judges as members. One of the missions of the CBA is to bring to the residents of Chicagoland useful and relevant information in law to improve the quality of our lives and to improve the quality of um, our neighbors' lives. Hi, my name is Mariam Ahmed, and I am the current president of the Chicago Bar Association. And we're so glad that you are able to join us for today's program. Here's how this program will proceed. I will introduce each of our esteemed panelists to you one by one and each will give a brief overview of his or her law practice. Then I will ask the panelists to each address specific areas in estate planning. These are top issues that minimally we think you need to know. Then I will turn to the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen and ask the panelists questions that you have entered. So I need you throughout the program to enter into the Q&A box any questions that you have for our panelists. And I promise I'll reserve the final 30 minutes of the program today to address all of your questions with our panelists. Let's welcome our first panelist, Deborah Cole of Hugendorn and Talbot. She will provide you with an overview of her practice and legal work, and then she'll explain to you what the field of estate planning is and why we believe you need it. Deborah, welcome. Thank you very much, Mariam. I am a partner with the law firm of Hogan Dorn and Talbot LLP, and my practice is devoted to estate planning. Um, I also handle guardianship matters as well as real estate for my clients, business succession planning as well. Um, what is estate planning? Estate planning can be defined as the process of preparing a plan to manage your affairs through disability and to determine how your assets will be distributed after your death to family, loved ones, and charities in many cases. Everyone needs an estate plan because everyone has an estate. Your estate consists of some or more of the following. Everything you hold dear, think about it. That includes such things as bank and financial accounts, investments, business interests, real estate, art, collectibles, jewelry, furniture, life insurance, retirement, photos, and family heirlooms. Your plan will be unique for you. An attorney with experience handling estate planning matters will work with you to define which tools, whether it's a will, trust, powers of attorney, and more that are appropriate for your situation and will help you organize your affairs to complement any documents that he or she might deem necessary. Too often in the past, attention has been paid to the distribution of financial assets, avoidance of probates and tax issues as the essence of estate planning, which leads many people to think that estate planning is just for the, the wealthy, and that could not be more wrong. Other goals of estate planning haven't received that much attention, and I think the pandemic has brought some of those goals other than cost avoidance and tax issues to the forefront. An important component of any estate plan is going to be identifying the persons who will make health care decisions for you if you are not able to make them for yourself. And it will identify how you want those decisions made and give guidance as to how those decisions should be made, particularly end of life decision making. 
Estate planning allows you to identify the persons who will manage your financial affairs, particularly during disability and after death. It gives you control by giving you the opportunity to provide instruction and guidance to those people who will manage your affairs during periods of disability. It plays a vital role in protecting you against financial abuse and exploitation, which is a phenomenon that is running rampant in our communities these days, particularly involving the elderly. A properly prepared estate plan will ensure that your assets are distributed to those people that you want it to go to in a manner that you want it to go, whether it's all at once or based over time or criteria that you've established, or in a manner that preserves eligibility for governmental benefits. A good estate plan can also preserve family relationships. A bad estate plan or no estate plan at all can exacerbate already difficult family tensions and make it worse. A well-prepared estate plan helps you to accomplish, accomplish these goals and many more, and it can ease the burden of managing your affairs felt by your family and loved ones so that in the event of a crisis, they can focus on what's really important, taking care of you and minimizing family drama. Estate planning is one of the most important actions you can take for your family and loved ones. And since most of us don't know or can't predict when we'll die or become disabled, I say the time for estate planning is now, no time like the present. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Our next panelist is Lainey Cruz Flores of Chuac and Texan. She will provide an overview of her practice and work. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Lainey Cruz Flores, um, and I am a partner at Chuhek and Texan in their Trust and Estates Litigation and Administration Department. Um, what that means is that we handle all sorts of litigation surrounding trust or estates, including will contests, who should be appointed as an administrator, the appointment of guardians, and the administration of guardianship estates, including those of minors. With that, um, I also do estate planning. As Ms. Cole explained to you, um, there is a lot of planning that can go into arranging for decisions that are to be made for someone who is disabled or someone when they pass away. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Our next panelist is Eric Wong of Kazuko Harris Duncan. Eric will provide an overview of his practice and his work. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel, and uh, I hope I can provide some useful information to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, I am an associate with Kazusko Harris Duncan. Uh, my practice is primarily focused on advising individuals and families with estate planning and estate administration. I work with individuals here in Chicago, as well as uh, families and individuals uh, around the world with uh, international and cross-border issues as well. Uh, I also am a frequent volunteer with the Chinatown Pro Bono Legal Clinic, where I start, first started as an interpreter and uh, continue to volunteer as an attorney now. Uh, and I speak Cantonese and Japanese, uh, not exactly relevant to this panel, but I thought I just wanted to share. And, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Eric. I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Kerry Peck of Peck Ritchie. Kerry will provide an overview of his practice and his work. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Mariam, thanks so much for uh, hosting and organizing this panel and including uh, my, me to present. My name is Kerry Peck. I lead the uh, 14 lawyer firm of Peck Ritchie. We have offices in downtown Chicago, the northern suburbs in Northbrook, and the western suburbs in Oakbrook. Uh, much like the other panelists, uh, we <clears throat> concentrate in the area of trust and estate litigation uh, and estate planning. Of course, trust and estate litigation is will contests. Are you unhappy that you were cut out of a will? Did someone leave uh, all of their assets to a total stranger? Were they financially exploited? Things of that nature. Likewise, uh, we're involved in courtroom work involving a selection of an administrator uh, in a battle over who controls the state administration, minors cases in which someone under the age of 18 may inherit money. Uh, and things of that nature. We also do, as I mentioned, the state planning. I had the privilege and honor of serving uh, some years ago as president of the Chicago Bar Association, uh, like Mariam, who's our current fine president. 
And I was commissioned to write two books by the American Bar Association on Alzheimer's disease. One book, Alzheimer's and the Law, was written for lawyers. And the second book written for family members who have a loved one stricken with Alzheimer's, Don't Let Dementia Steal Everything. So thanks for tuning in today. I think it's going to be a great program. And thanks, Marion. Thank you, Carrie. I'd like to introduce our, our final panelist. Her name is Mita Rowe. And Mita Rao is uh, from Rao Legal LLC. Mita will provide an overview of her practice and her work. Thanks, Mariam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mitha Rao, and I'm the founder and managing attorney of Rao Legal LLC. I'm truly honored to be here with you today and really honored to speak alongside this distinguished set of panelists. Um, I enjoy helping individuals, families, business owners, and healthcare providers plan for their future and primarily practice in the areas of estate planning and administration. My colleagues have done a great job um, describing that area to you, so I won't reiterate it further. I also enjoy helping business owners and entrepreneurs plan for their future, specifically through the areas of succession planning and business counseling. Um, I relish the opportunity to speak with communities on the benefits and importance of estate planning and do so frequently. And to that end, I am thrilled to be here with you today and whatever, share whatever knowledge I may have that can be of use to you. Thank you, Mitha. Now, I'm actually going to start with you. And um, there are two specific areas I want to ask you about. Let me ask you about the first. The first is powers of attorney and advanced care directives. Can you share with our participants what these are and why they are so important? Happy to do so. Let's get started. Um, advanced care planning involves planning for the possibility that you may lose the ability to make decisions during your lifetime and therefore need um, someone to step into your shoes to make medical or financial decisions for you. Um, this concept of losing the ability to make decisions for ourselves is sometimes referred to as incapacity. And for that reason, sometimes advanced care planning will be referred to as incapacity planning. Through specific documents, a power of attorney for healthcare and a power of attorney for property, you can designate who will step into your shoes to make decisions for you regarding your medical and financial affairs if you become unable to do so. Now, typically people hear this and they often say, wait a second, this sounds like a concern for an elderly person. I don't think I'm that old, so why do I need to really do incapacity planning? Now, to be sure, um, incapacity planning is a heightened concern for the elderly who are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. But the reality is that illness or injury can strike any of us at any time. We are especially aware of this right now. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and we have either seen or heard firsthand how COVID is indiscriminate in who it impacts. It can impact a 20 year old just as it can impact a 60 year old. And those individuals can both lose capacity as a result of COVID and therefore not be able to make decisions for themselves. When that happens, it is your power of attorney for healthcare and power of attorney for property that will step in to instruct those around you regarding what you want on the healthcare side and who will handle your financial affairs. Through these documents, you will select someone legally known as an agent to step into your shoes and make, under the power of attorney for healthcare, healthcare decisions and under the power of attorney for property, financial decisions regarding your assets. Now here again, people will often stop me and they'll say incapacity planning sounds interesting, but I've already spoken to my family and they know what I want. So why do I need to formalize my instructions and my wishes? Why is this so critical? And here's the reality folks, if you do not engage in incapacity planning and select and control who will make these decisions for you, the law is going to select that person instead. People hear this and they become really uncomfortable. I can understand. For example, let's say that I'm in the hospital and I lose the ability to make decisions for myself. My healthcare team needs to know who to turn to to continue the course of my medical treatment regarding any end of life planning that I may or may not have. If I do not have a healthcare directive, here's what my healthcare team is going to do. 
they are going to look to the Healthcare Surrogate Act. And believe it or not, that act lists the priority order of decision makers. It starts with a guardian, it goes to my spouse, and then any adult child that I may have, a parent, so on and so forth. If you're hearing this and you're thinking, this priority order doesn't match what I want, then that's exactly what a healthcare directive is designed to help you solve. It puts you in control of who will make these decisions for you and puts you in control regarding the range of decisions they can make and what wishes you would like them to carry out. On the financial side, if you become temporarily unable to make decisions for yourself, the consequences of not having a financial directive are even more dire. Now your loved ones will be forced to go to court and obtain a guardianship of the estate over you. Simply put, the court is now going to decide who this individual is that will step into your shoes and manage your financial affairs. We're talking about your bank accounts, your retirement accounts, and even your home. This entire situation can be ameliorated and you can be put back in control if you execute what's known as powers of attorney. As I mentioned, under your power of attorney for healthcare and your power of attorney for property, you will select an agent, i.e. someone to step into your shoes to make decisions for you, along with backups. You're probably thinking at this stage of who you select is a really important choice and you would be correct. It is critical that you trust this person. When the time comes for it, they need to act on your behalf and in your best interest. In fact, when you are preparing these documents, you will be advised um, to have a discussion with your agent ahead of time. Make sure that they thoroughly understand what your wishes are and the responsibilities that they must undertake and confirm that they will do so. Now, these documents are wide ranging. They are very customizable to fit your healthcare and financial preferences. So it goes without saying, it is much easier to plan before you land in a crisis. In fact, you have to have capacity to enter into these documents. For that reason, we always recommend that as part of your estate plan, you consider also incapacity planning and do so at a time when you are calm and centered and can thoroughly evaluate your needs. On a closing note, I'll just say it's really important to work with somebody that understands incapacity planning tools. These are customizable documents that are malleable and are there to serve you. So please make sure you work with somebody that can best utilize these documents to serve your needs. Thank you, Mita. Um, Deborah. Can you talk to us a little bit about ownership issues as they relate to properties, how properties are titled, uh, real property that is, and bank accounts? I think that's an important component of estate planning because how an asset is titled will often dictate what happens to it if you're disabled and at your death. And a lot of people don't pay enough attention to that. I think the first step in estate planning is to make an inventory of all of your assets. Whatever it is, how it's owned, and how it's titled. There are, this is the first step to prevent surprises. For example, I've had in the last month, two ladies give me a call to say that their husband died and they thought that the house that they lived in was jointly owned. Actually, it was owned just by the husband. They had a second marriage. Now, in order to perfect her ownership interest in that house, probate will be necessary because he had no will. And unfortunately, half of the house will go to her and half of the value of that house will go to his children, all of which are not hers. Surprise, ownership is important. What happens to bank accounts that are jointly owned? What happens to retirement and how does that how is that distributed? Beneficiary designations are extremely important, particularly for continuation of tax deferral on, on those on retirement accounts. Um, I think, again, the first step to any planning for assets is to identify them and make sure you don't forget them, and then work with a competent, experienced estate planner to put together a plan that encompasses all of your assets. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Um, let's turn now to Eric. Can you explain to us, we, we have a number of um, participants who have younger families. 
what are some of the issues that if you have young uh, children, uh, that couples with children and even those without children should be aware of? Yes, so uh, when I interact with younger individuals, whether they are couples, uh, married couples, unmarried couples, with or without children, I, I often get the question, you know, do I need a will uh, right now? Or does you probably need a will or something now? And whether you need a trust is probably, it depends. Uh, most times there is no one size fits all. But in general, when I interact with younger uh, couples and individuals, I tell them, you know, important life events are a really great time to start thinking about planning for the future. Uh, one is, you know, when you're getting engaged or about to be married, uh, it's a great time to, you're probably already thinking about the future already. And it'd be a good time to start thinking about, uh, you know, those end of life decisions, kind of those healthcare decisions that we uh, already talked about. And uh, it's, uh, it's a good way to again, to take control, especially during these uncertain times. Uh, so uh, estate planning, uh, drafting a will, getting powers of attorney done is a great way to take control of these uncertain times and to be able to have your uh, fiance, significant other, uh, have the power to make those decisions and have access to certain information. The law, default rules in the law may not apply to you because legally they are not a spouse yet. So that's one way to take control and, uh, and a good time for young families with or without children to think about that. Of course, another great time to think about uh, planning and these questions is when you're, anticip when you're expecting or have had your first, second, third children, all great times to kind of rethink your situation and uh, reassess your plan if you already had one or put in place a plan if you haven't. Uh, I've heard stories about, you know, both grandparents on both sides of the family wanting to, you know, kind of hoping to uh, be named as guardians and take care of the grandkids if anything should happen. You know, that's a potential area of conflict and something that, you know, could be uh, taken care of and addressed head on. Uh, or maybe grandpa's a little too old to take care of uh, his grandson and, uh, you know, some alternate uh, individuals may need to be considered. So it's better to have those conversations with potential guardians uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, again, as we already mentioned before a crisis hits, uh, even for individuals, young individuals uh, who are single without children, there's some unique circumstances where uh, a state plan of trust may make sense. Uh, spoken with individuals who, you know, all their parents are, live abroad uh, and are not in the U.S. So in that case, maybe a revocable trust where uh, matters are handled uh, through a trust rather than ultimately through probate or a will or state makes more sense for administrative uh, purposes and offers advantages. Uh, Maybe you're single and you don't have a spouse or any children and, you know, you have parents and siblings and, you know, uh, maybe your father is not well, relies on Medicaid and there's Medicaid planning issues that could be addressed and taken care of. That would be advantageous and uh, Medicaid planning, I believe we're going to talk about a little later. So in generally, you know, uh, crisis can hit at any time at any age and, uh, and so having an estate plan can be an empowering thing for younger individuals, younger families, whether they have children or not, especially during these uncertain times. And uh, you know, regardless of your family situation or age. Thank you, Eric. I'm gonna turn now to Carrie. Carrie, would you talk to our participants about trusts and family estate plans? Certainly. Uh, I think that, that what you're gonna hear from everybody here today, ladies and gentlemen, is advanced planning is the key to the game. Uh, once a crisis hits, the options for planning in most circumstances are eliminated and more than likely you find yourselves or the family finds themselves uh, in the courtroom trying to solve the problems and pick up the pieces. So typically with uh, use of trusts, the most common use of trust is what we call a revocable living trust and a revocable living trust, and you've heard the phrase, I think, from, from a couple other people already, a revocable living trust is the state of the art of state planning to avoid probate. In Illinois, we have two types of probate. One is a lifetime probate, that's a guardianship. Is an individual capable mentally of making decisions? And the second type of probate is a post-death probate. And in Illinois, the takeaway here is if you die with assets in your name alone in excess of $100,000, 
regardless of the composition of those assets, the law requires that a post-death probate proceeding be opened in the circuit court of Cook County if you die a resident of Cook County. That's the Daly Center on the 18th floor where we have about 14 probate judges now that hear post-death cases and lifetime cases. So a revocable living trust basically is a concept in which you name yourself trustee so you don't lose control of your assets and you literally put your assets into the trust. Put your assets into the revocable living trust. You retitle those assets and that document contains the provisions that indicate who's going to be successor trustee should you become disabled or die and to whom you're leaving your assets. People leave assets to three categories, friends, family, and charities. That document will be in large measure the dispositive document for your estate planning. The use of a revocable living trust avoids post-death probate. That's the biggest benefit. And it's also a huge benefit that it can be uh, administered in the conference room of any of the fine lawyers that you see on the screen today. It avoids going to court. So that's the primary use of a trust that I think is, is most common today. And I think that most of our attendees would have heard about that or perhaps have questions about it. And uh, that would be my contribution on that subject. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question because you said several times, um, avoid, use the phrase avoid probate. Why is probate so bad? Why should probate be avoided? And can you explain to our participants what that even means? Sure. There seems to be a lot of, when you know, in high school, we studied Greek mythology, but today there's a lot of probate mythology. And so the reality is that again, post-death probate is the creation, literally you file documents, you create an artificial entity called a probate estate. And we're talking now about a decedent's estate. So someone that has died and has assets in his or her name in excess of $100,000. The law requires with or without a will, very important, with or without a will, that we go into court, we open this artificial entity called an estate, that estate literally becomes a tax paying entity, and we seek the appointment by the court of an administrator if there is no will, or an executor if one is named in the document. Thereafter, that duly appointed administrator without a will or executor with a will is charged with the fiduciary responsibility of gathering the assets, paying the debts, and distributing the property under the terms of one, if there's no will, the laws of Illinois, and two, if there is a will, under the terms of the will. So that's a post-death probate. It needs to be opened not less than six months because the law allows creditors, doctors, credit card bills, funeral parlors, anybody that you may own money, or even if you don't know anybody money, the law allows and requires that it be open not less than six months. Most are open far longer. And at the conclusion of that six months, the law requires that the administrator or executor account for the assets, account for the income, account for the expenses, and report to the court. So it's a very, very a uh, closely supervised process run by the judge. Uh, for example, you might need a, a permission to go in and sell the marital home, depending on the circumstances. So this is a kind of process that you can avoid. Uh, it's a kind of process that is a bit uh, slow, delayed uh, in large measure by the law uh, and can run into some expense that you can avoid if you plan in advance. All right, well said. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Um, Lainey, Mitha was talking about um, advanced care directives. 
Can you talk to our participants about specifically planning for disability and Medicaid planning, what that is? Yes, of course. Um, and I'd like to say first that Medicaid planning and disability planning, while not always one and the same, will typically come into play together. And before we get into the nitty gritty of it, I want to really impart on everyone how important it is is that you not engage in the in this planning without consulting an attorney. Um, I often hear that people will transfer the title to their house to a child to, so that they can qualify for Medicaid. Um, you'll hear that they will add people to accounts um, as uh, joint owners or just gift money and think that this will eliminate the need to consult with an attorney. Um, this can be detrimental, one, because you can be denied coverage. And even scarier many times, if you have someone who's already disabled and who receives public aid benefits, they can lose those public aid benefits if one of these transactions runs afoul of the Medicaid rules. And they're very complicated. And only, really, an attorney should be consulted before any of these transfers are made. Um, there tends to be this con misconception that contacting an attorney for any of these reasons will be very expensive and you cannot afford it. And that is not always true. And many times the mess that is made, if there is not advanced planning is much more expensive than pre-planning documents that as Carrie said, can be, a, be arranged and administered in a conference room or these days through a Zoom meeting or even over the phone many times. And on that, I should note that not being able to meet with your attorney in person, just as a side note, doesn't mean that you can't accomplish these things. I, I probably all of us have come up with some really creative ways to make sure that our clients can have these advanced planning documents done in advance. Um, but back to Medicaid planning and disability planning, whether it's for yourself or a loved one, say that you have an adult disabled child or a minor child who you know will live with a disability for the rest of their life. In these estate planning documents, most specifically in a revocable living trust and even in a will, you can draft a what's called a special needs trust. And in Illinois, they, they're known as OBRA trusts. And these assets can either be of the individual or what money that you can leave as an inheritance to someone that will, while allowing them to have funds to supplement their living and improve their quality of life, not prevent them from qualifying for public aid benefits. Um, there are limits to the ages by which time this can be accomplished for an individual. So say that I become disabled, I'm under the age of 65, I can have funds placed into different, let's say a special needs trust, specifically an OBRA trust, and you'll hear a first party special needs trust that will protect those assets so that they can use to supplement my life, but I can still qualify for public aid benefits, including group homes, sometimes called SILAs, and nursing homes. So it's very important when you create these documents that you advise your attorney of anyone who you would like to leave money to or who may inherit that has a disability and whether or not they have Medicaid or are on public aid benefits today does not mean that they won't need them in the future. Many uh, parents with minor children or even adult children plan to care for that child for the rest of their lives if they need that kind of care. The problem is that the parent, while they don't want to think about this, may not be around for that child's entire life. And they may need to go into some sort of institutionalized living. And I know that we'd like to think that it, the word institution is a bad word and that we would never want that for relatives, but it can be the appropriate place and it can be under very nice circumstances um, for an individual and it may be necessary. And you want to know that that person's life can be improved buy money that you left them and that it's not doesn't just all go to the state or to Medicaid unnecessarily. And these things can be easily accomplished with some advanced planning through wills, special needs trust planning, or even a revocable living trust that creates that for the individual. Thank you, Lainey. Um, Mita, what is a transfer on debt instrument and why is that so important to this discussion? Sure. A transfer on death instrument is an instrument whereby an owner can um, transfer his or her residential real estate to one or more beneficiaries um, and bypass the probate process. Carrie spoke at length to you about um, 
uh, the probate process. Um, in particular, he highlighted you know, the expense and delays involved with it. And for that reason, many people who engage in estate planning also seek to avoid probate. Um, they come to appreciate and understand that while a will is a great first step, it may not necessarily keep their family out of probate court, which can add a level of stress and hassle at the back end. And so they often say, not only do I wanna provide for my loved ones, make sure that the disposition of my assets goes to those whom I want, but I would also like, if possible, for my family to avoid probate. As Carrie said, to avoid probate, you have to know what triggers probate. And probate will be triggered when the value of your assets is over $100,000 and includes real estate. Um, Deborah spoke to you about the importance of how your assets are titled, and she mentioned what's called beneficiary designations. One way to keep some of your financial assets out of probate is to use beneficiary designations. These are accounts that you can set up with a financial institution where you designate who will take that account upon your passing. And in doing so, that asset will stay out of probate. But what do we do about real estate? What options are there to keep our real estate out of probate court? Uh, many people think that the only option available to them is a revocable living trust, which involves a level of complexity as well as added expense. But there is actually another solution out there for those who have more, straightfor most, uh, more straightforward estates, and that's called a transfer on death instrument. Um, through this instrument, as I mentioned, an owner um, can designate one or more beneficiaries that will take an interest in their real estate upon the owner's passing. It's a really simple um, instrument. It follows many of the same formalities as a deed, so fairly straightforward. The owner just has to indicate that the um, residential real estate will transfer upon his or her passing. Um, and the most important requirement though is that the owner must record this in the county where the real estate is located before the owner passes away. If they do not record it before they pass away, then it is an, the equivalent of having done nothing at all. And suddenly your family can wind up in this place that you were trying to avoid which is probate court. Um, so a transfer and death instrument is a wonderful tool to keep your property out of probate and allow the passing of your residential real estate to um, your beneficiaries without them having to go to court and sort of um, undertake the hassle and expense of that proceeding. Thank you, Mita. Mita, um, I'm gonna ask you and Carrie this next question. Um, Eric talked a little bit about uh, children we have a, a lot of participants today who have children or have children in their families for whom they want to care after they pass. Can you talk, and I'm gonna ask Carrie to do the same thing. What, what advice can you share uh, or advice can you impart on them to protect this, their children's heritage? And I'll start with you, Mita, and then Carrie, if you can answer that, how to protect your child's heritage? Sure, um, as Eric mentioned, um, one of the ma major reasons that people often engage in estate planning is planning for their children's future. It is not uncommon for people to want to engage in estate planning during significant life transitions and becoming a parent is a significant life transition. When that happens, we may naturally think about how do we safeguard our children's future? What tools are there to help us plan? Uh, Carrie and I are going to talk about uh, three particular topics very briefly. One is the role of guardians. Uh, the second is when minors can actually, um, or when your children rather, can legally inherit. And the third is original additional planning tools that may be of interest to you if you want to have further control over when your children can inherit. So let's talk about um, guardians. Um, one of the most important decisions you are going to make in your will is to select individuals who will serve as guardians to your children in the event that both parents are deceased, incapacitated, or otherwise unwilling or unable to care for the minor child. Um, this is a very important decision and it's a very important role. And in Illinois, there are actually two types of guardians. There's a guardian of the person and a guardian of the estate. A guardian of the person will oversee the child's day-to-day -day needs. He or she will make sure that the child is clothed, they're fed, their healthcare needs are taken care of, as well as their education. Like I said, this person is known as the guardian of the person. There is also a guardian of the estate. 
This is the individual that will be tasked with managing the minor's assets and using those assets for the best interest of the child. Taken together, these individuals will oversee responsibilities for the minor until the minor turns 18. Um, this is obviously a very important role, and you not only want to make sure you pick someone that you trust should this scenario arise and both parents are incapacitated, have passed, or otherwise are unable or willing to care for the minor child, but you also want to make sure that you have a conversation with this person in advance and confirm that they will honor your parenting values and philosophy if a situation should arise where they have to care for your minor children. Now you may be hearing this and some questions could be coming up. Um, well, you know, I mentioned that the role of the guardian ends at 18. Why is that? What happens um, regarding the child's assets at 18? Um, you know, what happens to the child's assets and anything I provide for the child before 18? Well, Carrie's gonna offer a helpful hypothetical to answer these questions. Thanks, Mita. So Mariam, you asked about heritage and I wanna, uh, Mita hit on it, but I wanna give an example. If you want to preserve uh, heritage issues relative, for example, you want your children to attend uh, a particular you know, denomination school, you want your children to attend Catholic high school, you want your children to, to grow up uh, in a particular area, you want your children to, to associate with particular family members and the like, the selection of the guardian is going to be critical to having that occur but make sure you have a conversation with that guardian. And if you're gonna to say to them, I want to, them to go to parochial school, uh, if, if I'm gone and killed in a car crash, you better leave them the money to do it or they're not gonna be able to, to fulfill uh, your whims and your desires uh, you know, regarding those issues. Um, in terms of how children inherit assets, Misa did a great job explaining to you that Children can't inherit until they're 18. If they inherit money, for example, if uh, mom is already deceased and dad purchased a life insurance policy uh, for $200,000, and let's assume they had one child and dad suddenly dies in a, uh, a plane crash, so you'll remember, uh, the $200,000 life insurance policy cannot be distributed to a child under the age of 18. And that's probably a good thing, but it's gonna be necessary for uh, the family to go in and appoint, unless it's previously done, again, advanced planning, key to the game, to appoint a guardian to administer that money on behalf of that child until that child reaches the age of 18. Now, the scary part of this discussion is when that child reaches the age of 18, they're entitled to that $200,000. So the question is, who wants their 18 year old child to walk away with $200,000? They're probably gonna go out and buy a new car. They're probably gonna do whatever they can to spend the money and make it rain to impress a new girl or a new boy that, uh, that they're you know, now uh, in love with in high school or starting college. So we wanna make sure these things don't happen like that. If they're capable at the age of 18 and competent, they're entitled to the money. So at the end of the day, we want to perhaps consider the creation of what we call a testamentary trust in the documents, a testamentary trust that says, when my child turns 18, he or she gets one third of the money, but they don't get the second third until they're 25 and they don't get the third, uh, the balance of the money until they turn 30. So hopefully as they mature, they're less likely to blow that kind of money uh, and, uh, and, and try and impress their friends uh, in an immature fashion instead of save the money for their college and things like that. So that's a very quick overview uh, considering the time circumstances uh, that we're facing this afternoon. Thank you, Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just one additional uh, planning tool that we wanted to speak out ever speak about ever so briefly is a UTMA account or Uniform Transfer to Minors account. 
Uh, this is a custodial account that you can establish through a bank in which you appoint a custodian to oversee um, the miner's assets. So we're talking about cash and any other investments until the miner turns 21. The legal age under which a miner can, um, or legal age under which a child, I should say, can own assets is 21. So it increases that 18 threshold to 21 if you establish a UTMA account. As Carrie said, many parents hear that age of 18 and they think, I'm not so sure how I feel about an 18 year old inheriting assets. A UTMA account is a simple and expensive way. Again, it's a custodial account you can establish directly through a bank um, in which you designate a custodian to oversee the child's assets until they turn 21. Important to note, any transfer is irrevocable. So you want to be sure that you are thinking very carefully about what you put in the account. Um, you can also empower your executor through your will to establish this account. Um, for your child if they feel that that is an additional planning tool they would like to undertake. However, if your executor decides to open a UTMA account on the back end, so now you're no longer with us and they decide it's a good tool in which to house your min minor's assets, um, they may need court approval depending on the amount that is in there. If they seek to transfer $10,000 or more into that account, they may um, at that point, they would need court approval. So as you're considering the different range of options, don't forget about this custodial account. It's simple, it's inexpensive, but make sure you know what you're doing because any transfer is irrevocable. So you wanna be certain that what you're putting in there is um, what you actually want to be in there. Great, thank you both. Can I make one quick point? Yes, yes. I, I think it's very important for everybody attending here today and, and Lainey uh, hit on this, but we, we need everybody to understand that during the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, prior, early on in the, in the COVID pandemic, Governor Pritzker issued an executive order allowing us to do all of these documents in general, not everything we're talking about, but many of the documents, the estate planning process remotely. And that means that we can sign on into a Zoom call like this. The law requires that we record it but you don't have to worry about coming into anybody's office and nobody has to worry about you coming into their office. So all of this can be done virtually remotely and that's critically important today in getting accomplished this advanced planning. Thanks. If I could touch on one quick thing, um, just to piggyback off of them. Yes, go ahead, Lainey. Disabled adults are much like minors in that they cannot it just inherit if they are legally disabled in that there is a guardian appointed or should be meaning not that they have a physical disability but they are unable to make decisions for themselves and so part of the planning is in advance appointing an individual who can be responsible for their inheritance not only because we want to protect their public aid benefits but because we want to try and keep them out of guardianship and even if there's a need for a guardian of the person to take care of their healthcare decisions, you can avoid the expense and the court involvement of a guardian of the estate by planning in advance, similar to how you would do for a minor child. Thank you. Thanks for that addition, Lainey. Let's turn now to Deborah. Deborah, um, can you talk to us about any special LGBTQ estate planning issues that our participants should be aware of? Be glad to. I think most of the other panelists have alluded to what happens if you don't have an estate plan. The legislature has written one for you, and unfortunately, most of us, or most of you probably don't know what that involves. But basically, there's laws that determine if you die without a will or, or need advanced directives, how your property will be allocated and distributed. A lot of the planning that the legislature has done is based on some old concepts of what is a family. And it's set up for spouses in particular. Now, no matter where you are, although there is the Defense of Marriage Act, there are limitations as to how far the law recognizes same-sex couples and even same-sex marriages. So, Rather than rely on the legislature's tools that have not quite caught up with modern families, what you want to do if you're in one of these relationships, and that's heterosexual as well as uh, lesbian or gay relationships, you want to put in writing and develop tools that are specifically addressed to you and override the defaults that are in the state 
uh, prepared or the legislature's estate plan for you. And this becomes particularly important for LGBTQ members and because even more so than the general society have have exchange, are exchanged from family members. And so this default that says if you don't have a health care directive or you don't have a, a will in place and defaults to certain family members, that may be a family member that's hostile to you and your lifestyle and your partner. And you wouldn't want them to be in control. So it's critical that this is a time for you to define what it is that's important to you and who you want to manage your affairs and not rely on the default legislative plan that has been prepared for you. I think also people have taught, I think Carrie mentioned about trust and as a estate planning tool. I think for most people having a, if you've got assets that you want managed on behalf of young people or disabled, the trust particular, the trust play based plan allows you to go beyond 18. You can use a trust to determine the trustee can be directed to have certain beneficiaries meet certain milestones such that it's not just age. It's not just the amount. You can control that through drafting in your estate plan. And I think for everyone, that is an important part of today's and modern estate planning. And it's, again, it's not just for the wealthy. 200,000 is a lot of money for an 18 year old. And you might wanna stage that based upon criteria. Did they finish college? Are they working? But with the trust in place, the trustee can manage the assets, provide professional investment advice, counseling to the young person as they grow into maturity, but they can also make distributions in the meantime if there is um, a critical need or they want to buy a house or start a business, but that trustee can be there to guide that young person, look over the business plan, look over the house before that goes out. So part of this is really advanced planning, thinking through what you want to happen to your assets while you're still here and can think about it and you know your family better than anyone. And so that advanced piece, I think, is more important for everyone, not just members of certain segments of society. Thank you, Deborah. Lainey, um, some people say, well, I have life insurance. Can you talk to us about pre-planning and pre-need, not just life insurance? Yes. So there are different types of life insurance. I'm sure many of you know there's term life insurance, whole life insurances, but there's also pre-need burial arrangement life insurance options. And your chosen funeral home can assist you with this. Um, the one note I'd like to make is in particular with disability planning, um, or if you are concerned that you may need to go into a nursing home at some point, or that you may need to qualify for public aid benefits so that you can have some sort of care. Perhaps it's um, care from the state that's coming in to care for you or a loved one. Um, I often get calls saying, you know, how do we protect our money from the government so it all just doesn't go to the government or the nursing home? Um, that's, if that were easily accomplished, I, I think that would be much more accessible to people. There are tools um, when planned ahead of time that can help you with that, that an attorney um, who's skilled in that area can walk you through. But one important component, even when you do these types of plans, are to do a pre-need burial arrangement. And when you speak to the funeral home to ensure, um, and if you have the access to an attorney who can help you, it's always good to have the attorney review that policy because you wanna make sure that it does comply with the Medicaid rules and that it actually does not disqualify you from public aid benefits by that purchase. Um, this can be a beneficial tool if you come into, let's say, $10,000 that you may have been inheriting from someone or some sort of accident or that for some reason you have ten, you know, three to $10,000 and you don't need it right now and you're concerned perhaps with public aid benefits, it may be an easy fix to have a pre-need burial arrangement done. And then you can also know that your family knows exactly what it is that you want. It's another tool for control so that you can decide what happens. It's all laid out for you, hopefully in more detail in your power of attorney for healthcare that says exactly if you want your organs donated, which ones, if you want to be cremated or not, but it's also all paid for and does not become an issue because if you leave 
me as your beneficiary on the life insurance policy, that's my money. I don't have to pay for your funeral. I don't have to pay for your burial. I don't even have to pay for the luncheon. And I probably, if not, probably all of us on this call have seen that unfortunate yes. circumstance where you have a child or a spouse as the beneficiary of a policy who was supposed to arrange for this and just doesn't. And legally, there's nothing we can do at that point to help you. Um, so with that, just if you can do it, um, do it, speak to any funeral home and they should be able to assist you. Just tell them, you know, tell me about the Medicaid compliant policy so that if that's a concern for you, you can make sure to, to have that kind of plan. Thank you, Lainey. That was really rich, rich information. Carrie, would you please explain to our participants what intestate is? Sure. <clears throat> intestate is dangerous, okay? Intestate means you die without a will. <clears throat> and what that means, and literally I had uh, a case like this last week, okay? If a uh, husband and wife are going through a divorce and husband dies without a will, his wife is going to inherit. It's that simple. His wife will inherit a portion of the estate and the children will inherit a portion of the estate if there's children. So the reality here is that the state of Illinois has created a will for you if you don't do one for yourself and you're entitled to change it any way you want. The only person you can't entirely disinherit is your spouse. A lot of people come in and say, you know, I've got three kids. One of these kids, I never wanna see him again. I never wanna give him a nickel, okay? And at the end of the day, if that's what an individual wants to do, they're entitled to do that. But you must plan to do that. If you die in testate, again, the fancy word is without a will, that's what it means, that child will inherit money from you if you don't plan. So literally, the state of Illinois has a chart. This is who inherits if you die without a will. So ladies and gentlemen, make your own decision. Don't let somebody else make it for you. And if you write a will, you can disinherit anybody or you can leave money to anybody, except you can't disinherit your spouse under the terms of a will. I'm staying with you, Carrie. Can you talk to our participants uh, who might own business about what it means to have a business succession plan? Sure, thank you. So if you own a business and you, you fundamentally, uh, if you're a sole owner, uh, then your business is likely to pass to your heirs or your family under the terms of your estate plan, or if you die in testate, under the terms of no will. So if I own a, a hair salon and I die without a will, and I leave a wife and three children, half my assets are going to my wife and half my assets are going to my children divided by three. And what if the children don't want any part of it? Or what if they want to have a war with their mother? And frequently we see a lot of kids at war with their parents. So at the end of the day, if it's a sole proprietorship, it passes by way of your planning, your estate planning. But more often than not, many people own partnerships or corporations or businesses and LLCs and a variety of other types of, of mechanisms of ownership. And more often than not, we uh, recommend that those owners talk to their partners, find out what the terms are for the potential buyout, and we prepare what's commonly called a buy-sell agreement. And that is a provision, if I become disabled or if I die, my partners are going to pay my estate or pay my relatives for the value that we've agreed upon in general in advance for my interest in the business. But again, this is, requires advanced planning. One theme you've heard from everybody here is, you know, no planning is going to be an explosion. Planning is the way to go. And so if you want to pass your business to your partners or you want to pass your business 
to your family, you need to plan in advance. Succession planning. Thank you, Terry. Um, Eric, uh, I saw in the chat a number of people inquired about at or low cost estate planning organizations. Can you tell our participants about some of those before we turn to the questions? Certainly, uh, I would love to provide some information on that. First of all, the Chicago Bar Association offers a lawyer referral service uh, and can help anyone who's attending this webinar uh, connect with attorneys like ourselves on this panel. Uh, you can access that online or by phone at 312-554-2001. Uh, for other, uh, certain individuals, there's also a variety of uh, ways to act for uh, to access uh, free or reduced cost legal services. One, another service offered by the Chicago Bar Association is Wills for Heroes for veterans and first responders. Uh, I volunteered with that uh, before COVID. Uh, currently it's virtual. So uh, I think you have to go online and set up a point, uh, an appointment and schedule that now. But before it used to be uh, one instance, it was at the Chicago Police Headquarters. Uh, other organizations such as the Chicago Bar Foundation's Justice Entrepreneurs Project is a small business incubator that has a network of attorneys committed to affordable legal access and uh, tend to be more open to fixed fees and other arrangements. Again, uh, that's the Chicago Bar Foundation's Justice Entrepreneurs Project. Uh, there's also the Center for Disability and Elder Law that operates and runs uh, so various neighborhood uh, clinics and workshops uh, within the Chicagoland and surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, again, I believe given the current situation, they are not running those clinics in person. So again, given these uncertain times, uh, I would suggest uh, my general advice is to go online. Uh, again, Chicago Volunteer Legal Services is another organization that runs neighborhood clinics, uh, such as the Chinatown Pro Bono Legal Clinic that I regularly volunteer at. Uh, they also have the Probate Court Assistance Project, uh, which helps uh, people who unfortunately may not have planned around uh, avoiding probate and have to manage the affairs of a loved one with going through the complicated and sometimes intimidating probate court process. So uh, there's that service as well, if kind of this post-death uh, post uh, planning, and they also have a, a lot of child and adult guardianship services as well. And that's uh, again, Chicago Volunteer Legal Services. Um, there's also plenty more organizations and unfortunately, or very fortunately, I cannot name them all here, so. Uh, all right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn to the questions and um, thank you to the participants who took time to uh, draft all of these questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, first question. How can I find a specialized lawyer that can help me with the best option for a special needs teenager and his future? Whichever panelist would like to jump in and answer that. I think that there are numerous attorneys who handle these types of matters. And I think that you're going to need to go do some internet searching to find attorneys who indicate special needs planning in their bio. I think that it's important that you interview at least two so that you feel comfortable that they understand the issues that are unique to your situation. I'm also going to throw a shout out. Um, Eric mentioned this, I'm gonna say it again, the Chicago Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service. If you go to the Chicago Bar Association's website, www.chicagobar.org, you'll see the tab for the lawyer referrals uh, the lawyer referral program, and it can assist you as well. Um, our next yeah, question, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, Mary, I just wanted to say something about do-it-yourself estate planning, okay. if I may. Maybe yes. that was a question that came up, but I think what's important is that everyone on this panel has mentioned the involvement of an attorney in their estate plan. Now, the box that you can get that says, here, you can do this yourself, does not have the attorney that you're sitting here looking at with the experience. You don't know what you don't know. Your estate plan embodies everything that you hold dear. So you want to make sure that you don't make those mistakes because they can't be corrected while you're gone. It's critical that you know you have the peace of mind when you go to an attorney who has experience, and that's key, you talk to them about their experience, 
they understand your unique situation and can use the right tools and the right provisions within those tools to address your specific need. You so, won't find that on a do-it-yourself program. Right, and you sort of just answered the next question, which was about um, where can we access templates, resources to prepare a will, estate plan, documents, pro se. And for the reason that you just articulate, that's actually not something you really want to do. I just, I, the, worst, the worst examples, the messes that come to my office, a lot of them originate with do-it-yourself documents. I think Mia made reference. And many times after you have a do-it-yourself, for us to unravel this and straighten it out, it's going to cost more than if you had went to an attorney in the first place. Thank you. What's the difference between, I'm going to keep going through the questions just because there's so many. Um, what's the difference between a trustee and an executor? Who'd like to answer that? A trustee is a trusted party who administers a trust. A trust is like a manager of property that's in the trust. A trust agreement is really nothing but an agreement for the management of property and the trustee manages property that's in the trust. An executor manages property that's in an estate. An estate as assets consists of assets that were left at your death that were in your own name. We had to go through a probate proceeding in most of these instances. The judge appoints the executor named in the will. If there is no will, the court will appoint an administrator whose role is similar to the executor in the probate court. But executor means court proceeding. Thank you. Thank you very much. What options are there available for an individual that does not have a POA assigned? Power of attorney. I can answer that or attempt to. Okay. Um, so if you don't have a POA assigned, the first option, assuming that you are still competent and able and have the capacity to sign a, a power of attorney is to have one drafted and done. It should be something that's pretty easy. Um, where you run into trouble is if you're asking for someone who no longer has capacity, a parent who's aged, has dementia, and you're wondering whether or not it's still appropriate for them to sign a document. Or there's the misconception that you can just have the person sign it as long as they can put an X or put their signature on it. Um, at that point, it's too late to plan. It's another reason why it's, it's important to do it now. Um, and at that point, the only option is guardianship through the court. Um, the, the next question is, should a different trust be set up for each real estate, automobile, et cetera? Uh, people generally don't put cars in trusts but uh, real estate can be owned in trust. It can be owned in a revocable living trust. It can be owned in a land trust. It can be owned in an LLC. There's a lot of different ways to own real estate. Many people own, uh, if they own more than one piece of real estate, particularly commercial, they put it in a different type of entity, uh, perhaps multiple LLCs. But uh, it's case specific and it's fact driven as to where you put an asset in what type of entity. Thank you. How does a medical professional access a medical directive once it is created? When it's created, I recommend that my client supply the executed healthcare directive to their physician and any of their healthcare providers. Most of the um, group practices in the hospitals allow for a central repository. So I go to Northwestern, I give my healthcare power of attorney to my internist, but he puts it in the database. And anytime I consult with a professional associated with that database, they can look it up. So it's important that you not just give it to your agent, but you also give it to your healthcare professionals, any healthcare professionals that you are seeing. Thank you. Is guardianship done through probate court? Yes, it's as Carrie mentioned, there's during life probate and after life probate. Um, it is during life probate court for both minors and a disabled adults. Okay. How often should one review their estate plans? Can chime in on that. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think kind of uh, 
any significant life changes uh, is a good time to reconsider your current situation and whether if you have a current estate plan, whether that plan still accomplish, accomplishes the goals you had for that plan. So um, when you're having children, when children are going to college, when you move across state lines, I believe another question in the Q&A was, you know, if you had a trust and you moved across different states, whether that trust is still valid and uh, it is valid, but there might be differences in, in state law that may need that trust revocable trust to be uh, updated. For example, in Florida, there are additional restrictions on who can inherit the primary residence that needs to be taken into consideration, where under Illinois, there are simply not those uh, uh, restrictions. So anytime that, you know, a significant life event is a good time to do that. And if even if there isn't significant life events, it's a good time to just review it periodically to make sure, uh, you know, it's still accomplishing the goals that you want to accomplish. So. Okay. The next question, if you set up a living trust, how do you transfer real estate to the trust? Is there a mortgage? Does the mortgage mortgagee bank have to approve? For your residence, there's a deed. And even if there is a mortgage, there is a law that would prevent any, uh, the, well, let me back up. Most mortgages have a provision that say at the death of the uh, borrower that the um, asset holder, the lender, can accelerate the mortgage and have the entire amount due. However, it also says that if there's a transfer that they can accelerate the mortgage. Now, in a state planning to avoid probate, you want to convey your property to the trust and you do that by deed. If it's your residence, then the residence, there's a law that prevents the mortgage or the mortgage or from um, mortgagee rather from, from accelerating the mortgage. Now that's not true on other assets. So you must check into the in continuance of your um, title insurance and whether or not you need the provision for from your lender to make that happen if there's a mortgage. Otherwise, if it's paid, but there's no mortgage, you may do a, a simple deed for any other type of property. I might also say that having a trust allows you to minimize or eliminate probate in other states because you can transfer real estate from other states into your, your Illinois trust, if you will, and avoid probate from those other states. Okay. Can a will or power of attorney be contested by anyone such as a family member not included in the will or family members not appointed the power of attorney? That's where Carrie comes in. <laughs> Thank you. So the answer is that, that uh, will contests are very common. They are uh, based on two uh, grounds. One is a lack of mental capacity or what we call testamentary capacity. So for example, if somebody wants to contest my will, they need to uh, allege that I didn't understand that I was signing a will. I didn't have the capacity to form a plan in my mind. I didn't know who my family was and I didn't know what my assets were. So that's lack of cap testamentary capacity. The other basis for contesting a will is what we call undue influence. So if uh, someone came to uh, you and said, I want you to leave all of your assets to me or I'll break your legs, that's clearly undue influence. But what we typically see is far uh, more mild influences, which are usually emotional in nature. Uh, and it might be a new uh, relationship, it might be a financial exploitation case in which a caregiver unduly influence a patient to persuade them to do a will. So in large measure, those are the two grounds to file a will contest post-death. The, the attack a power of attorney, the, generally, if you're not named agent, you can't really attack a power of attorney. You can uh, allege that the selection of the power of attorney and it was signed under undue influence, but it's not as clear cut as in a will contest case. Mm -hmm. What happens to a trust that was created in Illinois when you pass away in another state? Do you need to have a trust in your resident state? Nita, jump in here. 
No, I'm going to leave this one to someone else. I actually wanted to make another quick point, if I can. This is relating back to just a question. Um, you've heard people say that you know you need capacity and to enter into powers of attorney. That you know will can be challenged if you don't have capacity. There's different levels of capacity for each document, but the bottom line is you want to be sure that you enter into these documents when you're healthy, so that um, you know if they do get challenged, we we can at least support that you had the necessary capacity to enter into them. Another reason to not plan when you're in a crisis. But I'm going to leave this one. Um, I'm going to share and have someone else take the floor for this one. Okay, just to restate the question: What happens to a trust? that was created in Illinois when you pass away in another state, do you need to have the trust in your resident state? Not necessarily because in this day and age, people are moving. And so generally the trust is gonna be valid, but there may be some issues with the choice of law as to how, if there is a contest, how that the law would apply in a particular state to an issue having to do with the, with the um, uh, the trust. Uh, good planning allows for flexibility in the trust. The, the trustee, who is the trustee? Can the trustee be out of state? Um, how? What is a successor trustee? How is that determined? But generally, the trust is going to be valid across all 50 states. Um, intriguing question here. If mother transferred her house to a living trust, notarized quick claim deed, but the deed was not recorded at the county office before death. Can the deed be recorded after death and will it be valid? Um, I, I can take a stab at that one. I think it, one question is when did that happen? Did it happen during the almost one year period when Cook County recording deeds was taking very, very long and we don't know what's gonna occur about that yet if someone passed away in the meantime. Um, that I would say in any event, if you're in that situation, speak to an attorney, it, it's a bit fact specific. Um, it depends why it wasn't recorded. Was it with your attorney? Was it with you? Is what you drafted valid? And I want to say that just you can't just record it as if she were still alive because that's mm -hmm. gonna create issues. So. Um, Unfortunately, they would say contact an attorney who can walk you through that depending on your specific facts and circumstances. Next question, if you have a will but do not have a trust, does it need to go through probate after death? A will guarantees probate. I think Carrie mentioned that earlier, will and probate. So a will, the only way that you can effectuate the will, that you can legally appoint a the executor is through court proceedings. This would apply unless there's there's less than a hundred thousand dollars and not real estate, and then court is not involved. That the key here again is planning, getting someone who knows what they're doing, so that you can assess in advance whether you really want to avoid probate or whether probate is something that 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 you, you, you're willing to have that expense after your passing, as opposed to incurring the expense for a trust to avoid probate during, at, at death and certainly during your life for guardianship proceedings. If your assets are in a trust and you become disabled, the trust has language that identifies who a successor trustee would be. This in most instances will eliminate the need for a court appointed guardian. So a trust takes care of avoiding probate at death and avoiding living probate should you become disabled. This next question is, does the real estate have to be owned free and clear in order to transfer it uh, upon death? No. However, I would caveat that too. You may have issues with the mortgage company and the individual who's inheriting it may need to qualify for the mortgage. Um, there, there's no simple or, or solution to that. It's just something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is if you do um, enter into or you decide to execute a transfer on death instrument, your beneficiary takes subject to any encumbrances that you have on that title. So they don't inherit free and clear. They inherit subject to whatever liens or mortgage you had on the property. Well, Mitha, stay right there, because the next question is, can shares in a cooperative building be transferred using a transfer on death instrument? 
Ooh, the residential real estate definition does account for um, different types of properties. I know that a condo in particular is mentioned. Um, I'm not entirely sure if a cooperative is specifically mentioned, but I think that the definition refers to the number of units. And if we are in a building, the number of units that are needed. So there again, we would want to work with council to make sure that the way the cooperative is defined fits under the definition of um, residential real estate under the transfer on death instrument. Um, another reason to have an attorney because um, the definition is, is specific as to what sorts of residential real estate it applies to, but generally speaking, um, it, it does apply to buildings where there are multiple units. So uh, I, I want to interject for all of you madly taking notes. Um, don't worry, the recorded program will be posted on the chicagobar.org website. Um, give us about a, a week and a half uh, after today to post that, but the program will be up and will be available for viewing afterward. One of the uh, questions dealt with that. Next question is, does a husband and wife have to sign off on estate planning documents? When is it allowed uh, for the wife to set up her own estate plan of her own assets, health, property, et cetera, separate from the husband? She certainly can do that. Any individual can set up their own estate plan. Where it can get a little complicated is if they own joint property. Now, in many cases, they want to do a joint estate plan. Even with a joint estate plan, however, you can identify which property is exclusively belonging to one or more individuals. So I do a lot of joint trust. And so we can identify what's joint property and what should be covered under certain provisions and what is one individual wife, husband's sole property and how that property should be disposed of or managed during life and at death. This next question is regarding guardianship. If the other biological parent has been or is absent and no custody was ever shared, do they still have guardianship rights until the child is 18? And I'm thinking if this current uh, guardian passes away. Well, this would assume that the individual who was a minor and now turns 18 is disabled and, and will require guardian upon turning 18. If so, that parent, is, you are required under Illinois law to give that parent notice, assuming you know where they are. They do, you know, technically and legally have the same rights because they are biological parents, but brought before the courts and, you know, I would assume there'd be a hearing and if you could prove that you were more appropriate because you've been the parent who's been in that child's life um, throughout their entire life until that point that you should be the one appointed absent there being some circumstances that the court found that you were not the appropriate guardian. This next question is for a single person without children. Sounds like using a beneficiary designations for financial assets and transfer on death real estate. It's theoretically possible to avoid post death probate without setting up a trust. Yes. Yes. So typically you could use what we commonly call payable on death accounts. Uh, if it's a, a bank account, obviously if it's a, a retirement account, a 401k, a 403b, you can name a beneficiary designation as well. And of course, uh, if you wish and you want uh, to give them access to the money during your life, you could put them on as a joint tenant. But don't forget, Joint tenants uh, should be chosen wisely. They have complete 100% rights to withdraw the money in the account. So that may not be the intent, uh, and you may want to designate that individual post-death as a payable on death beneficiary. This next question is, will my benefactor be responsible for, for a property having a lien by the government or is there a plan that can avoid this situation? Generally, no. <laughs> no, if there's a lien, it follows the property. And so unless there's provisions for that lien to be paid or satisfied, it's gonna stay with the property. 
Can I go back to another question if, with regard to the single people? Because I get a lot of single people coming in and saying, I don't really need an estate plan. But I think because of the things that we talked about that make up an estate plan, planning for disability is critical because you need to identify who's going to make health care decisions for you. That's a critical part of your estate plan. Who's going to manage assets for you if you're disabled? That's a part of the estate plan. So just doing beneficiary designations deals with what happens at death, but there's no instruction. They just get it when it's, when you die. There's no hold back. There's no management. There's no ability to look, assess the beneficiary's ability to manage the asset or, or their capability or their current state. They could be going through a divorce. There's all kinds of reasons why you might want to rethink whether you just want a beneficiary designation or one you, you want to might think about maybe the trust a beneficiary where you've got a trustee to manage it on behalf of the beneficiary. Or the me, I'm uh, so on Oh, go really go quickly. Ahead, real briefly. The person, the person who you chose as a beneficiary may predecease you and die before you do, and then you're right back in probate court. So that's another reason it's important to have a, a, a full estate plan. Thank you, Lainey. Thank you, Deborah. We're coming up on our closing hour. I'd like to go around to each of our panelists and ask you for some final thoughts and include it in your final thoughts. Could you please say your first and last name again? and tell our participants if they want to reach out to you after this presentation, how they might contact you. I'm going to go in reverse order. Order, Mita, we'll start with you. Sure, um, it has been a pleasure uh, being with you here today. I think one of the common themes that you're hearing is the importance of planning when you're healthy. Um, there are a number of options and considerations that you have to make when engaging in estate planning. And so do yourself a favor and you know, um, consider estate planning before you end up in a crisis so that you can make sure that you are effectively planning for your future and taking care of those you love. Um, to that end, if you have any questions, I think Mariam, you asked me to give my information, so I'd be happy to. Um, if you prefer uh, talking to me via phone, call anytime. Um, uh, you can find my information regarding my email or my phone number at my website, raolegal.com, R-A-O-Legal.com. Feel free to email me um, or call, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have and um, help you effectively plan for your future and achieve peace of mind. Thank you, Mita. Uh, Kerry, any final thoughts? Well, I, I commend everybody for signing on today. I think that uh, you've taken the first step to learn uh, more about this process. My name is Kerry Peck. I lead the law firm of Peck Ritchie. That's P-E-C-K-R-I-T-C-H-E-Y. Our telephone number is 312-201-0900. We offer our potential clients the opportunity to call us visit with us uh, at no cost, and you can determine if we can help you, and we'll let you know if, if uh, we're able to, uh, you know, if there's some chemistry here, we can help you, and uh, you're comfortable with us. So I look forward to uh, continuing more seminars like this, and want to commend Mariam for taking it out to the public. Thank you, Carrie. Eric, your final thoughts and contact information. Um. Hi, my name is Erica Wong. Uh, you can, I'm in, at Kazusko Harris Duncan, and you can reach me at e h u a n g at k o z l a w dot com. Um, and just to echo my colleagues on the panel, uh, you know it's very important to speak with an attorney who's uh, experienced uh, with all these issues. If there's anything you uh, you've taken away from this, is that everyone's situation is unique. So everyone's estate plan needs to be unique. There is no one size fits all. Uh, if default Illinois laws uh, don't achieve your goals, it's very likely that the legal Zoom default documents won't achieve your goals. So it's very important to reach out to someone who can ask you questions and that you can ask questions and really get to know your situation. And there's always, there's plenty of affordable and or free legal services out there uh, reach out to a local legal clinic. They can refer you to someone who can help. And, um, you know, this is a legal community, com community can be pretty small. So we can, uh, everyone here can uh, connect you with someone who can help you, I believe. So uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Eric. Lainey, 
final words and yes. information? So I, I guess my final words would be make the investment for yourself to have the peace of mind to know that the documents are done. None of us want to talk about passing away. None of us want to talk about something, you know, happening to us and being disabled. And we definitely, it's difficult to approach parents or loved ones to make these decisions. But I urge you to call an attorney, even if you think you can't afford it, like Eric said, make a call to one of these organizations, see if you qualify. If you don't, they'll refer you to an attorney who's familiar with the area of the law that can help you. Um, again, my name is Lainey Cruz Flores. Lainey is L-E-Y-N-E-E. -E. If you Google Lainey Cruz Flores, it's me who comes up. There's not too many of us. Um, I'm at Chu Heck in Texan, and that's C-H-U-H-A-K. And my phone number, if you'd like to call, is 312-201-3401. Thank you all for making the investment of time, if nothing else. But I hope that you make the future investment to make the call and get started on your planning. Thank you, Lainey. Deborah, final thoughts and contact information. First off, Miriam, I wanna thank you for putting this together and I wanna thank my fellow panelists. This is probably one of the most informative public um, um, forums for estate planning that I've participated in in 25 years of practice. So it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, I am with the law firm of Hogendorn and Talbot and that's H-O-O-G-E as in Edgar, N. D-E-O-H-O-O-G-E-N-D -E -E as in dynamic O-O-R-N and Talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T-L-L-B. -L -L um, you can reach me by email and that is D for dynamic, C-O-L-E at H as in Harry, T as in Tom, L-A-W dot com. And my phone number, my direct line is 312 294 5774. And I want to echo my other panelists in saying, really, you need an attorney to work with you. Don't interview at least two if you feel comfortable that you, you so you feel comfortable with what, what, what the person that you're working with, because it's a long-term relationship. It's not a one-off. You're going to need to update periodically through changes in the law and changes in your family circumstance. And don't let costs be a barrier. Talk to the attorney, frankly, about what their fees might be. And if it's out of your range, look at other low cost alternatives. But I'm telling you, please don't not do anything. That's criminal. And I hate to see you in this position after having been through getting all this great information. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you participants for joining us. The Chicago Bar Association will be continuing to sponsor public education programs. What we do best is what you've seen today, the law. And it's our mission to take the opportunity to impart our legal education and trainings in ways that benefit you our communities and your families. The uh, video of this particular webinar will be posted on the Chicago Bar website in a few weeks, www.chicagobar.org under the public education tab. I thank you so much again, have a wonderful week and thank you for joining us, goodbye.